helps this team find chemistry, not just identity. And so he's out with the left foot sprain still listed day to day. And perhaps, John, that makes it a little easier for the Ivy League's leading scorer, Brandon Anderson. Yeah, we'll call it easier, but, but ultimately it puts more of a pressure on the Duke Blue Devil defense as a whole, as a collective unit, to continue to communicate, understand where he's at at all times. And so Anderson, senior from Mawa, New Jersey, averaging the 21 points per game inside. Vernon Carey has been a double-double machine. The outstanding freshman from Southwest Ranches, Florida, averaging nearly 19 points, over nine rebounds per game. And we've had multiple flip-flops in the last 20 minutes of the Duke starting lineup. Now Jack White is back in as opposed to Matthew Hurt. And it really doesn't matter. It's more about the minutes and who's on the floor at a crucial time. Unless you're a player, it totally matters. It's not like ego and pride aren't involved down there. Well, getting another start at the point is Jordan Goldwire, who has played extremely well. And as part of this Duke lineup, it is changing without Trey Jones this second straight game. You've got Cassius Stanley, Goldwire, Baker White, and Carey. And, you know, the reserves on this Duke team have played such a big role this year that gives the folks here in Durham, John, great hope for where this season could wind up. Well, they've got versatility, but they also have good balance. And when you have good balance and versatility, you, you can play a, a variety of different ro rotations. And that's something Coach Case figuring out on the fly. I mean, he's going to have to do that. When, like I said, you bring in a new class every single year. They may only be here for a year, so you got to learn on the fly during the season. Over the last four games, Duke's reserves have scored over 32 points per game. On the year, almost 25 per game, which is the most for a Blue Devils team in, well, over five years. Jack White gets his own miss and pulls it back out. Baker. Well, he has been almost automatic lately, misfiring on his first attempt, and we've got a foul on the rebound. Personal against Jack White. And here is some full-court pressure with Brandon Anderson bringing the ball up. You've already met the senior point guard, Zach Hunsaker, Josh Howard. They call him T, Tamanig Cho, and Matt DeWolf. First possession, first turnover. I like the extended pressure for Duke because it allows the defense to get set and see the basketball. This is a young Duke team, still some experience, but the young kids need to see the ball first to be able to lock in defensively. They struggle at times in transition. A lot of that is just communicating as you're getting back in a scramble situation defensively. Foul on Cho, the all-conference junior who averages nearly 15 points per game. Second leading score for the Bears. Cassius Stanley works his way into the paint, missed the shot. Rebound comes to Zach Hunsaker, the rare three-time captain. He played junior college basketball as a freshman, and immediately upon getting to the Providence, Rhode Island campus at Brown University, was named a captain. Off the bounce, Anderson, a little strong on the pull-up. Goldwire with numbers. Stanley elevates and lays it in. Well, that's where that... This is where this Duke team is really at their best. When they can get a rebound, get out and run. They run lanes well, they throw ahead well, and that's where they just make plays. In the half court, there's times where they struggle. They get a little stagnant, and the lack of three-point shooting does hurt them. Bad spacing there. Leads to the turnover. White open corner three. Carey tracks down the long rebound and attacks. Boy, that's going to be a tough matchup for anybody Brown tries to put on him. That time, Matt DeWolf was just overwhelmed. It's kind of like a quasi-Euro step. He kind of James Harden that thing, just went into the body. But Vernon Carey understands, too, when you get that close to the rim in a one-on-one -on -one situation, just throw it up off the glass. You can go get your own rebound. Anderson, another clean look. Now 0 for 2 from the floor. White plucks the rebound. Well, you think about the rust. Last time they played was December 10th. Baker is fouled by Hunsaker. Duke with a, a four-game winning streak coming into this one, led by Coach K. He's uh, produced 28 NBA lottery picks over the years, the most ever, and has taken his program to 12 Final Fours. I don't even think we should be able to put a resume up for Coach K because it's just it, it just makes everybody else feel inferior. You look at those numbers; it, it's it's terrific. The the outcome that he's seen, but ultimately the influence that he's been on the game. DeWolf missed the little layup. 
in transition. Stanley a little short. The Wolf after the rebound, and the Brown Bears have it. That's where Brown's got to be good defensively in transition. If you force those three-point shots, so long as you're in position to rebound, you've got a better chance. In half court, they're not getting a lot of those defensive rebounds. And Brown comes in with a 5-5 five and five record in the Ivy League, picked fifth preseason. Stanley with the throwdown. The freshman from Los Angeles makes it 6-0 Duke. Cho fouled on his way to the basket. Gosh, Stanley doing what he needs to do, just taking passes away. Gets that hand out in the passing lane. He's not off balance, though. He's not off balance to the point where if there's a back that it takes him out of the play. And then he is Mr. Highlight. We know about the athleticism, the explosiveness. The problem is any athlete that comes to Duke, any guy that like a Cassius Stanley that is a freak athlete, he's going to be compared to Zion Williamson. And it's just not fair. Well, he out jumped he Zion Williamson. And there you see the last four games for Stanley. He's had a couple of injuries he's dealt with this season. But uh, yeah, he broke the one year program record for vertical leap that Zion Williamson put up a year ago. But Zion Williamson had a feel for the game. I, I would say. Zion's feel and athleticism is far beyond or was far beyond his skill at the time last year as he develops more and more skill I, I'm really interested to see him eventually play what was the over under how long it was going to take to get Zion's name into the broadcast we did it in seven minutes shot clock violation another forced turnover the fourth committed by Brown it was probably under seven under seven yeah I mean, that was my first time here Head coach Mike Martin, the reigning Ivy League coach of the year. Six years he was an assistant at Penn, and so he's been in this building a couple of times as an assistant with the Quakers, but first time as a head coach and first time for all of these Brown players to be on this floor was at their practice yesterday afternoon. And it's a big deal for anybody yeah. coming in here, broadcasters yep. as well. And I'm not shy about that, not at all. I mean, this is, oh, wow. The follow slam by the long and rangy Jalen Ganey. Long and rangy, that's what you're going with, huh? Yeah, that, that, that's just explosiveness. Got to keep them off the glass. Sometimes when a shot goes up, when you're not ready for it, defense isn't ready to box out. Well, he's 6'9 with a 7'2 wingspan and barely shoots anything but dunks and layups. You can see why. Javin Delorier off the nice feed. John, he's another one of those pieces that we've talked about, and a veteran piece now who has been around, a senior, a multi-year captain, so valuable for Coach K. Well, he's developed instincts. Didn't have him to start, but he's developed instincts as he's gone here. He's kind of crafted a bit of a feel for the game, and making the right read is ultimately what makes your team even better. All four brown points from gaining for not only the team, but, but the fan base uh, for Michigan State and now for Duke basketball because you have that bit of continuity that you know what you're going to get. And I think that's important when you have such a, a new group, a, a new crop year in, year out, where you've got to have that steady constant, right? That guy that you can trust in, in tough situations. You can trust to be the best communicator on the floor right now. That is Trey Jones. And in the meantime, his understudy, Jordan Goldwire, at the free throw line shooting two. And Goldwire has steered this club very well in Trey Jones' absence. Now, it's hard, too, because you, you've got to kind of be your own brand on the floor. You can't try to replicate what somebody else does. So it's going to be a different look. And I think the more time Goldwire gets, the better this team's going to be. It adds depth and experience. Matthew Hurt has come into the game. This is Alex O'Connell. Gives it back to Hurt in the right corner. Tough running shot. No, O'Connell able to get a hand on it. And Duke will keep underneath. Going to break. I had mentioned the rust. This Brown team hasn't played since December 10th. Duke's played, what, one game in 22 days we talked about? Look, basketball is all about rhythm and flow it's, it's hard to find it when you haven't played real games so so i would say it's going to take a good 10 minutes until we really get rolling into this game doesn't mean you should shut anything off though wendell moore has also come in for duke as o'connell misfires gets his own miss and brings it back out yeah brown's last game was 18 days ago as hurt misfires duke now 0 for 6 
from three point land. But that's rhythm. I mean, the game is all about rhythm. Shooting more so than anything else is about rhythm. Lob to the rim. Ganey's got all six points for Brown. O'Connell attacks. Looked like Ganey might have gotten a piece of it. Here comes Brown with numbers. Anderson had it knocked away, and Goldwire whistled for the foul. And Brown, when they're able to turn the corner, that's what they want to do in dribble handoff situations or ball screens, even faking a ball screen. They want to be able to turn the corner. They don't have the playmakers. This is not a knock. This is a reality. They don't have the playmakers to just break you down and make a play. They, they need to use actions to get you mixed up defensively, faking ball screens, dribble handoffs, to, to be able to turn that corner. They want to get either dunks or open three opportunities. Who does it? Ganey sets the screen for Anderson. Tamanig Cho with the travel. Turnover number six. And I'm interested to see how Duke gets Vernon Carey going. It is important for him to establish himself. He's seen a double early in the game. His eyes have been up. He's done a good job, but he needs to be consistently more mobile in the post. He went for 20 and 10 the last time out in the win over Wofford nine days ago. O'Connell, no. Duke remains cold from the perimeter. And you know, in looking at that Wofford tape after the game, Anderson able to save it back out to Cho. Ball hit the shot clock up above the backboard, so it is Duke basketball. But uh, Coach K was telling us at shoot around this morning that in reviewing the tape of the Wofford game, which Duke really did play well, yep. defensively yep. played very well, he said he, he wanted to tell his players three things about that. Anticipate, think, and see. What did he mean yeah. by that, John? Well, look, it, the, the game is a lot simpler than we make it out to be, and that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to simplify the game. Anticipate is just simple. Jump to the ball. You know, be a play ahead. Don't chase the play. It's really simple. Calm down. Think. I mean, it's ironic because there are times when you say, don't think, play with instincts. But but think. Communicate with one another. You know, be purposeful. I mean, that's really what this is all about. And, and ultimately, to me, that is building good habits. Those are winning habits. These are guys that have, it's been easy for them at every level they've played. Now, this is a great challenge. You've got to do a lot of little things really well to succeed at this level. That foul was on Matt Wolf, uh, DeWolf, the starting center for Brown, his second. Anderson. Blocked out of bounds by Baker. He was able to get around the first defender, Wendell Moore Jr., but the second guy got him. Anderson. Now it goes, secondary defender. It's good to be trailing that play. Blocked out of bounds by so you guys Baker. give up on it when you see someone taking the ball ahead. Those guys usually end up back on the bench, though. DeWolf finds himself alone, and he missed the layup. Here goes Stanley with the hammer. A little tomahawk dunk makes it 12-6, Blue Devils. David Mitchell, not much of an offensive threat, gets it back out to Hunsaker, who finds Anderson for his first three. And that's the threat. As the, as the play gets broken down, the defense gets put in a scramble situation where you do end up chasing the play. It's your communication that allows you to defend that, but that extra, extra pass leads to a wide open shot. More to carry. Ran into a brick wall in DeWolf, and then missed the shot. Hunsaker fights for the rebound. The Brown Bears pick fifth in the preseason Ivy League poll, hanging with the fourth-ranked team in the country through the first eight minutes and change here at Cameron. Mitchell with a good look, and we are tied at 12 apiece. I would say the difference between you see is you don't even have anybody to get the ball in bounds. Got to call timeout. This Duke team is not engaged against Wofford. They were engaged in the in the game, and that's been the problem so far today. Right now, Coach K taking the jacket off. 
The Hall of Famer is fired up and letting his troops. 69 graduate of West Point is fired up and trying to engage his players who have not really shown that kind of ump so far this morning. Yeah, I'll tell you what, it, it does seem as if this team just didn't show up yet. Doesn't mean they're not going to. I think they're going to bring a little something after this timeout, particularly on the defensive end. Something as simple as fighting over screens. That, that you learn a lot about whether a team is really locked into a, to a game based on how they fight over screens. They haven't done it yet. And what they've done is allow Brown to hang in there for a while and have a little belief. 11-15 remaining in the half, tied at 12. Here's Cassius Stanley, who leads Duke with six points. In they go to Carey, loses his footing, and it's a travel. He saw the double team coming, tried to spin baseline, and just had his feet go out from underneath him. He hasn't been able to get it going yet, so I understand that, that assertiveness, right? Like, I need to make a play. The problem is, if you're going to get a double team and you're five, I'd say more than eight feet away from the basket, you've got to look opposite. You've just got to trust teammates. And I know right now, always seven from three for Duke. It's hard to trust that you're going to get something better. Shooting under 30% as a team so far as Duke, which has now turned it over three times. Anderson dump it off. This time, DeWolf goes up strong and lays it in. An 8-0 Brown run puts the Bears in front. Yeah, and that was just too easy just getting by Cassius Stanley to, to put your big in a bad situation where he's got to cover two. DeWolf trying to hang inside with Carey, giving up a lot of size. Already has a couple of fouls. Here's that matchup. The double team draws the foul and a chance for three. So Vernon Carey did great work to get position in the post. The problem I have with it is that you don't want to become too Yudoka Azabuki, where you just get set on the block or set in the paint and you're not going to move. At times, you've got to be able to vacate the post. You've got to pop to the top of the key. If you vacate the post, you open up driving lanes for your teammates. Right now, so much of, of the attention is going to go wherever he's at in the post right now. And despite missing the free throw, one thing Carey does a lot better lately than Azabuki is shoot free throws. Yeah. He has been very, very good over the last month. Mm. Nothing but net for Brandon Anderson. The Ivy League's number one score has six, and Brown is back in front. Yeah, you had mentioned belief, you know, you, and hope. Well, it's also just confidence. The fact that you can get good shots if you're Brown gives you confidence. That's a travel. Gives you confidence in your abilities against a superior team. And it's in a tough environment, too. We had mentioned that they want to get threes. This is a dribble handoff situation. Goldwire gets caught underneath. And that's swagger right now. You don't want to play a team with swagger. He's a confident young man from Mawa, New Jersey. His mom and dad made the trip down to see their son play at Cameron. Baker denies Hunsaker. Brown will keep the ball along the baseline. She saw his mom and grandmother in the, in the hotel. They were excited, and they said, it's just stressful. My parents have been there. I know it. It's my brother's coach in Division Three, and that stresses me out. <laughs> of course, your brother Joe, one of the all-time greats in Penn State basketball history. How many points did he finish up with with the Nittany Lions? More than me. <laughs> A few more. 15, 1600, something. I he was closer to 2,000, but we fabricate everything. <laughs> and there is Mike Martin in his eighth year as head coach at his alma mater. He was a part of a great class of Bears who back in the early 2000s put up more wins than any other graduating class in the history of Brown basketball. And so he knows this program through and through. And he is now the second winningest coach in Brown history behind the great L. Stanley Ward back in the 50s and 60s. Who can forget L. Stanley Ward? Exactly. Joey Baker taking his time for the layup. First two points for the sophomore from Fayetteville, North Carolina. But where did it come from? It came from Vernon Carey away from the basket. At times, you have to clear that post to, to allow back cuts, driving opportunities, and now a breakaway dunk. Six for Vernon Carey, Jr. Well on his way to a ninth double-double. And he puts Duke back in front.
Kamenik Cho has been held in check so far, and he dribbles the basketball away to Goldwire. Goldwire, end to end, missed the layup. And we've got a foul on the rebound. Hey, look, this is a great back cut, but it's a great back cut because it's there. Why is it there? Vernon Carey in the, in the dribble handoff situations away from the basket. There's no one back to the basket to protect the rim. And then Vernon Carey doing his job. That's the anticipation Coach K talked about. See the play, see it develop, anticipate, go make something happen. First foul on Joshua Howard. Tomorrow we'll have a good one for you in our afternoon college basketball game on ABC and the ESPN app. Bill Self leads number five Kansas into Maples Pavilion to take on Oscar Da Silva and 11-1 Stanford. The Jayhawks and Cardinal have met in this non-conference matchup the last three years with KU winning all three. Our coverage begins at 3 Eastern, noon Pacific on ABC. Stanford's good. They're aggressive. They get after it. They, they just look to push it. They look to shoot quickly. Not the old Mark Madsen Stanford Cardinal, I'll tell you that. No, and Jared Hass, you know, former yep. Kansas Jayhawk, is the reason why A. Stanford has gotten off mm -hmm. to such a great start this year and why this series continues with him as head coach of Stanford. Cho, challenge shot. Stanley's going to be called for the foul. He doesn't like it. Second foul on the freshman out of Sierra Canyon High School in Los Angeles. Usually good when I see calls in slow-mo, maybe three times. I don't know. I look for backspin. If you don't have good backspin and you usually shoot with backspin, then it probably was a foul. That shot looked okay, so I, I doubt he really fouled him that hardly. Is that correct? Hardly? No, it's not. Just that hard, right? No. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I was waiting for either the Penn State or UCLA education to kick in there. I'm not sure when either of them are going to kick in. I, <laughs> that history degree I got from UCLA, I, maybe one day I'll teach. Oh, I'll count on you. Probably for a little, not history. <laughs> a little history of the Duke and Brown basketball program. Sure. That'll be your forte today. With John Crispin, I'm Doug Sherman here at Cameron Indoor Stadium. Thanks so much for joining us as we get to the noon hour. Duke with all it can handle so far with the Ivy League opponent. Try to take advantage of their huge size mismatch. Matthew Hurt with his first two, and it's a 7-1 to one run for the Blue Devils. Well, that's terrific recognition from a young guy. He understood he had the, the advantage, so he went after it. Anderson, an air ball. Out of bounds. Off of Ganey. It'll be Duke basketball when we return to Durham. Payton is thinking a little less, although thought was the next one that he had. Anticipating making plays. Look, when you can't get good offense going, when you're struggling to shoot the three and you're struggling to get anything in the post with double teams, you've got to create your own offense. You do it on the defensive end. Well, they've got 18 of their 21 points from the paint. The other three are from the free throw line. They are 0 for 7 from distance. Here's Hurt again inside. Over Howard, no. DeLaurier the offensive rebound. Dangerous pass. O'Connell able to bring it out to Hurt with 10 to shoot. O'Connell lets fly. And another offensive rebound. The possession continues for a reach-in foul against Joshua Howard. He's the reason why Brown wanted to schedule this game. He's from Charlotte, North Carolina, out of Providence Day School. And so Mike Martin is one of those guys. Uh, who, as a coach, wants to bring each of his players back to their home region. He actually tried this year to get a game in Utah for Zach Hunsaker, his three-time captain, but he said all six Division I teams in the state of Utah said thanks, but no thanks. Jeez. How about that? That's what happens when you're you know, too good. They went and beat uh, San Diego State pretty handily last year, and that got some people's problem. attention. You know, I'm watching the shooting woes for Duke, and that is a problem. It kind of becomes an epidemic because it, it, it's something that gets in your head. It's a mental issue. You've got to watch the passes that they're receiving when they're trying to shoot. You've got to throw good, crisp shooting passes where a guy can catch it in rhythm, be shot ready, and get a good look. I haven't seen a lot of crisp passes to open three-point shooters, and, and I, I've got to think that has something to do with it. First foul on Matthew Hurt. And so Tamanig Cho out of Lowell, Massachusetts at the line shooting two.
tip off your weekend and the new year with our star-studded NBA doubleheader Friday on ESPN and the ESPN app. Joel Embiid and the 76ers take on James Harden, Russell Westbrook and the Rockets at 8 p.m. Eastern, and then LeBron, Anthony Davis, and the Lakers host 80's former team, the Pelicans at Staples Center. Our coverage begins with NBA Countdown Friday at 7 Eastern. Goldwire hanging in the air for two. Mitchell thought about it. Goes around Delorier. And we'll have a chance for three. A blocking foul called against Matthew Hurt. That's one where I would just like to see Matthew Hurt get there just a little bit quicker. He's a step behind the play. And instead of trying to get your feet set and take that charge, just get there and wall up. Get there quickly, go straight up. That was like a foul on a flop at the same time. Second foul on Hurt. And so David Mitchell, sophomore from Roxbury, Massachusetts, at the foul line. I mentioned he doesn't score a lot, but he has already scored six, doubling his season average here today. Great place to have a season high. Huh? Why not? Moore, White, O'Connell, Goldwire, and Delorier, the five on the floor, and they're home whites. Duke blue lettering. O'Connell misses on the runner. Down four. Brown on the move. Show dumps it off. Friday the reverse, but it wouldn't fall. Dan Friday is a tremendous talent who has had a problem as a freshman staying healthy so far this year. Whistle on the drive, and Jack White will shoot a pair. Personal against Cho. His second. This is just almost an amazing finish. I mean, from our angle up here in the perch, uh, I thought it was good. There are there are pretty misses, you know that, right? Yeah, I, I have pretty misses. <laughs> I do. It's like any time you go to dunk on somebody, you know what that's like, and you brick it off the back of the rim, well, and I don't chest to chest. Like that's a pretty miss. It's it was it's the guy that missed the dunk is still the the more intimidating of the two. Now, you had me until you said a missed dunk. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, yeah, that's true. My I've bad. never missed a dunk. Yeah, made one either. Well, there's that. <laughs> First two points from Jack White, the senior co-captain from Australia. And we saw the athletic ability of Dan Friday, who uh, Brown assistant coach T.J. Sorrentine, the former Vermont Catamount great, said Friday is the most talented player he has recruited during his tenure at Brown, which is now a decade long. Here he is with the basketball. Trying to work on White. Wave off the basket. Offensive foul. Look, that's good defense. Sitting down, taking the charge. I just hate the charge in college basketball. I, I would take, I would complete, I don't know how to do it. You know, it's kind of like that, I, I have an idea, but there's really no way to do it. It's just kind of in theory. Take the charge out. You have to jump. You have to block a shot. Yep. I would love to see that. That charge, it, it's just, to me, it slows the game down. I think it's the hardest thing to get right, too. You put a restricted arc out there, it doesn't make it any easier. If anything, it makes it harder because you look to see if their feet are, be, are, are outside of the restricted arc, yet not really set. Moore spins into the lane. Here's Friday with a basketball. Well, you can see, by the way, Friday attacked the basket and finished in spite of the offensive yeah. foul. He's not afraid. No, he shouldn't be. Look at the body on this kid. And he's the type of recruit Brown and the other Ivy League programs are able to get nowadays that maybe a decade ago they wouldn't have. And Coach Martin was quick to uh, give the credit to Tommy Amaker, the former Duke yep. great, now Harvard head coach, who has really lifted the level of play across the conference. You know, the rising tide lifts all boats kind of feeling around the Ivy League that Harvard is now here and the other teams are coming up to join them. Rising tides lifts all, lift all, lifts all boats. And then when you look at it from a basketball perspective, it, it changes the narrative, right? It not only does it change the narrative, it also changes what you need to win within that conference. If you want to compete, you adapt to the conference. You, adapt, you at least adapt to the best of the conference. Much like, you know, quite frankly, the ACC has had to adapt to Duke in right. so many years. Yep. And guys like Jalen Ganey and Dan Friday, who we have seen contribute so far here today. 
would they have been Ivy Leaguers 10 years ago? Here's Brandon Anderson. All nine of his yeah. points have come from beyond the three-point line, and the Ivy League's leading scorer has the Bears back within three. And that play will drive Coach K nuts because it's just a lack of, of a sense of urgency, really. Wendell Moore's got to get up there. You've got to fight through any screen, get through it, and contest the shot. They just haven't done it. Gary is fouled by Mitchell, his second. I've said before, look, I mean, where are you? You're just getting lost. See, man, see ball, simple principles, right? Well, easier said than done, clearly, at this level. You've got to identify. If you're going to switch, you better know who you're switching on, and you better know where he's at. Otherwise, he's going to get an open three and keep his team in this ballgame. Here's the three-time ACC freshman of the week at NSU University School in Florida. His father of the same name, of course, played in the NFL. Tremendous lineman for many years, Vernon Carey. And it's interesting uh, when you hear Coach K talk about Vernon Carey's transformation this year from being a perimeter player in high school to now being told to go and utilize your size and athletic ability in the paint. Yeah, I think there still needs to be a balance because the offense has been better when he was used at that high post, uh, high post area or, or out to the three-point line. You have better spacing. Like I said, look, Kansas struggled with that earlier this season, trying to play two bigs with Yudoka Zabuki just posted up in the paint constantly. Hunsaker, no. Carey bats it away. Hunsaker after it. And it comes to Joey Baker. Wendell Moore, the crossover. His pass deflected. Baker brings it back to Moore, who feeds inside to Carey. Goes over his left shoulder, no. Jack White up again. And he sticks it in. Timeout on the floor is between semesters, so far yeah. fewer students who have made it into Cameron today. But uh, crazy nonetheless, yet another sellout. Not since 1990 has there been an empty seat here in this building for a men's basketball game. And I'm sure there was a reason in 1990 that it wasn't sold out. Let me see the, the kids that paint their, their shirts on or whatever. It's always like a variety. Right? The one kid who's proud of the body, the other one's like kind of apathetic, and the other one gave up a long time ago. Right. Yeah, my freshman year at Syracuse, I painted my face and kept my shirt on. Good job. You were the apathetic one, weren't you? By the way, you're welcome for that. <laughs> Under three minutes remaining. This is Duke's largest lead so far today in a game that began this morning, 11.31 a.m. tip-off. Show trying to back his way down on Cassius Stanley. And Show, who is averaging over 14 points per game, still without a field goal. He hasn't gotten to the basket. He's been forced to take tough jumpers, and that's what you want. Carey, no. And it's been an equal opportunity misfire for Duke. They've had eight guys get into the game. Now seven of them have missed a three-point shot. Not a lot of those threes have come from inside out. Drive, kick, threes. That's what you want. Those are rhythm shots where you're stepping into the shot. Your shoulders are squared. Your feet are set. It's in rhythm. That's going to be a higher percentage three. They have not gotten that yet. They've gotten a lot of those. White off the feed from Goldwire. It's the only thing keeping Duke in charge. You know, their second chance baskets. Other than yeah. that, they have gone kind of toe for toe with Brown. Yeah, and physical superiority can, can at times be fool's gold, right? That, that's not what's going to work against another, you know, strong, lengthy, athletic team. Well, as we mentioned, Duke is playing its only game in the last week plus they had a, a longer than usual break for the holidays and, and only once have they played in the last three weeks before today the next game will be New Year's Eve night against Boston College here at Cameron and also no Trey Jones you can't say enough about this guy's average about seven assists a game he's an initiator he's a facilitator he's the best on the ball defender in this conference so yeah that, that's going to change things for Duke it's a shot to the identity, but they've still got to find a way to get what they need, and so far they're doing it inside. Ten points for Vernon Carey Jr. off of the 11th Brown turnover. And so even without Trey Jones, the Duke defense has been able to get after Brown pretty well. Hunsaker. As it knocked away, and there's a foul called against Duke. 
The college football playoff semifinals are later today on ESPN and the ESPN app. Heisman winner Joe Burrow and number one LSU take on number four Oklahoma in the Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl at 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 Pacific. And then it's number two Ohio State, number three Clemson in the PlayStation Fiesta Bowl. And the winners will play for the national championship Monday, January 13th on ESPN. I think you and I are thinking the same thing about the semis coming up today, that game number two might ultimately yep. wind up determining who wins the championship this year. I don't know why I feel like that. I just do. Uh, watching those teams play, I think Clemson, we've just dogged them all year because they almost lost to North Carolina. Sorry for bringing that name up in this Duke broadcast, but you, know, you almost lose that game, and then we discredit everything else in the season. I don't really get that. Teams are good. Teams are a tough matchup at times. Sometimes they do things that you struggle to figure out. Doesn't mean you're not a good, good football team. I, and I think Ohio State is just as good as it gets. Defensively, offensively, they, they, they adapt. They, they, make, they counter whatever the, the other team's doing. Brian Day's been terrific. And it is weird not having the Crimson tied in for the first time since they instituted the college football playoff. Duke still over from three-point land. Yet they still continue to get after the offensive glass and will keep it on the team rebound out of bounds. Timeout, Duke. Back in 30 seconds. And 270 pounds has been a force inside so far here today for the Blue Devils. And he's gotten a lot of attention. A lot of the attention that he's getting is actually opening up offensive rebounding opportunities for his teammates. You, you see the production, but what you can't really put on paper is what he does in terms of challenging and changing the defense. Double teams should lead to open shots. The problem is Duke hasn't been able to knock many down. The good news is Duke already has 12 offensive rebounds in this ball game. Now 0 for 10 from 3 for Duke. Final 30 seconds of the half here at Cameron Indoor Stadium. Brandon Anderson trying to initiate with 5 on the shot clock. Off the switch, gets around Carey. Howard, a good look for 3. Well done, Brown Bears. Well, they got the switch. They got Vernon Carey on Anderson, and he just attacked. Baker. Carey's got time. Lost it. More no. Multiple attempts, and it's an empty trip to end the first half for Duke. Well, Brown has to feel really good about how they finish this half. Like I said, you got the switch, and then all you do is just put your head down and attack. Got an open look right now. Down six points. Vernon Carey leads all scores with those 10 points. Brandon Anderson has... You don't contain the basketball. You give a general penetration. You give up an easy one. Brown right now, once again, on a ball reversal. Late closeout, you give up a three. That's not being locked in without your leader, Trey Jones, who can dominate the basketball. But then eventually Duke settled in. Their ability to get out in passing lanes, knock balls away, get out in transition. Look, they haven't made a three-point shot in the first half. This is where Duke will win this basketball game. Their ability to execute in a half court, great back cut right there by Joey Baker, and their ability to turn Brown over and get out in transition. So it takes time to settle into a game. That's the reality of it. It takes longer to settle into a game when you play. Seth Greenberg here. Coach, this one's all they're talking about at DuPont Circle. Georgetown American Omar Yurtseven on early for the Hoyas. Yeah, this is a different Georgetown team since those defections, and they're playing more through Omar Yurtseven. His ability to score around the basket opens up the floor for dribble penetration. Matt McClung, I like this Georgetown team. Georgetown's five-game win streak, though, in peril. They're down one midway through that first half. And Florida, a little more comfortable for the home team. Noah Locke, Chris Clover. Florida's rolling. Yeah, Noah Locke's got to make jump shots. This is a Florida team that's still developing an identity. You know they're going to defend. The big question is, how do they score? Noah Locke making jumpers will open up the floor. Quest Glover gives him a penetrating guard that can get him easy shots. 32-12 in favor of the Gators there, still in the first half in that one. Uh, coach, coming up later today. Vernon Carey's been good. I think he's been one of the most consistent players on this team throughout the entire season. But Brown has had answers. They've been comfortable in terms of getting some mismatches, getting the shots that they want, whether it be through that triple handoff or, or just attacking. You know, if you get the mismatch you want, you're going to get the type of shots you want. And Brown's got just enough to stay in this basketball game.
Anderson is three of five from distance as a team. Brown is five of ten, and that's helped the Ivy League team to hang around with the Duke Blue Devils, who come in having won four in a row. But again, we, we stress that both these teams, not surprisingly, would have some rust today. They are both coming off of long holiday and final exam breaks. And uh, you, you hear from coaches, John, that this is the hardest time of the year because yes. they just don't know what they're going to get from day to day and game to game. And it's also just trying to find consistency in practices. You, you don't always have good practices around the holidays. Even though you should have their full attention once finals are over and students are off campus, it's just hard to be locked in and engaged. And that's where a lot of these kids don't realize they're not pros yet. Pros know how to bring it when they need to bring it. Anderson misfires. Offensive rebound, Tamanig Cho. Cho is blocked by Cassius Stanley. If Brown is going to hang in this game or pull an upset, they need Cho to get going. Stuck with only one point, despite averaging over 14 per game. Goldwire, Baker, Carey, Hurt, and Stanley on the floor for Duke. 12 points now for Vernon Carey Jr. That's not an easy shot either. You got to give that kid credit. He's got great touch. Good spin, took contact, just got it up on the rim. Some guys try too hard to make the shot. The, the guys that make more of them just try to get it on the rim. On cue, Cho, the junior from Lowell, Mass, makes his first field goal. All I'm paying attention to the second half defensively for Duke is just stance. Are you engaged? Are you locked into a stance? Vernon Carey, that, that little slip, that's going to be too easy. No backside help. Showed as if he was going to set the screen and slip. Wide open layup. You can see why he leads the ACC in field goal percentage at 61%. Efficient around the cup. He's got 14 points. I would keep going at Cassius Stanley until he shows that he's going to lock down, fight through a screen. There he just ran into it. Keep attacking. Cho, after the bobble, missed it. Rebound Matt DeWolf. And he missed the layup. Got to take advantage of those opportunities if you're going to hang with Duke here. Passing away from the double team, Baker. Duke still over from beyond the three-point line. And for Joey Baker, that is quite a contrast to what he has done this year. 53% on the year coming in. He went four for five in the win over Winthrop. Five for seven against North Florida. And he is 0 for 4 here today. Foul on Vernon Carey Jr. We talked about Vernon Carey. We know about his size. He's an impressive body, but he's got great touch, great finesse. He gets out of the post. He re-engages in the offensive action. This is not an easy shot. Bad angle. Just give it a chance on the rim. It's a guy who's showing a willingness to work to get open shots. And at times, that means vacate that post take yourself out of the play before you re-engage and he continues to put in a lot of work with assistant coach nate james still adjusting to the physicality of college basketball and we talked about the fact that Kerry didn't spend a lot of time in the paint as a high schooler offensive rebound howard hunsaker can't get the roll and the rebound comes to Jordan Goldwire quickly up ahead to Stanley O'Connell whips it inside Carey going to work give him two more that's 16 hard to defend Duke when you have a strong post player when the ball changes sides of the floor that quickly as the defense is rotating to get to the basketball the middle of the paint opens wide up as they're able to get the ball to Vernon Carey you know one of the things coach case told us about in recent days what they're working on with Carey Layup is made by DeWolf, is getting Carey, who's got really good footwork, to run baseline to baseline, not free yes. throw to free throw. And we saw that he ran baseline to baseline the last time and made himself available immediately. Uh, if you win the position battle earlier, if you're a guy like Vernon Carey, that's where you got your opponent beat, right there. If you win that position battle first, you're going to be able to dominate the game, do whatever you want down low. Because if you have position, you're close enough to the basket, that double team does nothing. You go right at it.
to Wolf. Backdoor pass. Howard on the reverse. 43-35. Brown back within eight. O'Connell lost the handle on the pass, and here comes Anderson and the Bears. Cho missed the dunk, but he was fouled from behind by Cassius Stanley. And that is the third on the freshman wing for Duke. The round, you are going to get wide open layup opportunities inside the paint. The hope is that as defense converges, they can get a three-point shot to fall. Well, he's got all eight. Duke points here in the second half as Cho continues to struggle from the free throw line. He is one of five so far today from the strike. Make it one of six. And so now with Carey on the bench, where do you go here, John? Well, Stanley dribbles the ball off his foot out of bounds. Take that opportunity away. But next time they get into a half-court set, where does Duke go without carry? I think you got to move it around the perimeter quickly. you got to use Javon Delorier as a screener around the perimeter, not just in the post. you got to vacate that post, open up driving lanes, and see who can make a play. I think that's what this comes down to. When you're not making shots, shots often dictate your emotional feelings during the game. It can't be that way. You've got to continue to be the aggressor. So I would create space and see who can make a play. Here's Joshua Howard, the son of former Michigan Wolverine great, and current Michigan head coach Juwan Howard had his shot blocked. Then the foul comes against the Blue Devils. It'll be two free throws for Brandon Anderson out of Don Bosco Prep in New Jersey. The personal goes against Matthew Hurt, and that is his third. I asked Anderson yesterday after practice, who's the toughest defender you've had to deal with in college? He said, Fats Russell at Rhode Island, who he's going to have to deal with next. On Thursday, the uh, Bears will play the Rams in Providence. Tomorrow, we'll have a good one for you in our afternoon college basketball game on ABC and the ESPN app. Bill Self leads number five, Kansas to Stanford, where the Cardinal is 11-1. The Jayhawks and Cardinal have met in this non-conference matchup the last three years with KU winning all three. Coverage begins on ABC, 3 Eastern, noon Pacific. I don't think there's any question Kansas' biggest strength is their size, but that also can be their biggest limitation. And the game is all about balance these days. That's just what it is. It's, it's inside-out balance. It's spacing on the floor. Versatility will win more in March and April than one or two good players. See that stat there, over a 1,000 games since Duke went over from beyond the three-point line. Coach K? I bet they're all thinking about that right now. They're like, it's been 1,070 games. The all-time winningest coach in college basketball history. I'm guessing he's not thinking about it at this point. Offensive foul against Goldwire. He's thinking about the fact more specifically and broadly the fact that the offense has not been good today. Yeah, that's not good offense. I mean, I don't know about the call. It doesn't really matter what I think anyway, but it's just not good offense. You know, just putting your head down and not having the space to be able to turn a corner, get an angle at the basket. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that you're not making three-point shots. Second foul on Goldwire, another Duke turnover. Just over five minutes into the second half. Anderson tries to find Cho, who was held from behind, and so Goldwire picks up his third personal. And talking to Coach K this morning at shoot-around, communication was big. You now, it's even more important when you don't have Trey Jones on the floor. You know, he's their best communicator. He's their leader on the floor. But communication is everything on the defensive end. That, that goes into building that chemistry that, that, that you need to be able to be successful in the ACC. You see these dribble handoff situations, the, these ball screen situations, they get lost because of a lack of communication. O'Connell clears the Mitchell miss. Now, communication is also feel, too. And that feel comes from a chemistry that you develop over time. This is a team that's still figuring each other out. Delorier feeds White, spins to the left, missed it, missed the rim. 
Well, he's happy to have missed the rim the first time because he's going to have a chance for three. Jack White's changed his game a bit. Right? You know, he came out, you expected him to be a better three-point shooter. He struggled, but he's still finding opportunities to impact the game. Good roll to the basket, keeps the ball alive, strong finish. And generally good body language, which is more important than you can imagine. Well, he, he's the consummate upperclassman captain that Coach K could want. Yeah. You know, there were times last year where he played games and Coach would just rave about the role that he had played, saying spectacular, things like that. You don't hear that about a guy who averages maybe five or six points a game, but he does his role very, very well. Tough shot by Anderson, who's now got a dozen. Goldwire gives it to Delorier. O'Connell swings to White. Good scramble defensively by Brown. Moore, tough shot. Able to get the roll. First two points for the freshman out of Cox Mill High School in Charlotte. I would say that's, but that's been what's most surprising is that you've seen a lot of tough shots having to be made by Duke. They, they, it hasn't been offensive continuity. It probably goes back to the start. No Trey Jones, but also you know, the long layoff. Again, Trey Jones, the terrific sophomore point guard for Duke, sitting out this ball game. His second straight game missed with a mild left foot strain. Moore had it blocked. Anderson. Able to stay ahead of Goldwire and lay it in. I feel like the way you said that mild left foot sp strain. Sprain. Sprain. I think basically what you're saying was hashtag would likely be playing if this was conference play. No question. No question, which makes you think all the more if there are no setbacks, he will almost certainly play against Boston College next time out on New Year's Eve. Long two for O'Connell. Yeah, it's a jumper. We saw a jumper fall. I don't mean to be so condescending about it, but it's important. You got to see it go through the hoop. Well, we see all sorts of strange numbers we're not accustomed to, both in college basketball and the NBA these days. O'Connell to steal, and he's bodied by Mitchell in the backcourt. Third foul on him. Well, Brown defensively, they've been in position. There's the backside help. Leads to an easy layup opportunity. I mean, this is how they've been able to kind of stay within striking distance. Ten points is within striking distance. And I think if you're Brown, you feel pretty good for the most part. You, you know you don't have an answer physically for Vernon Carey. Not many people do. O'Connell again with a long two. He's starting to heat up. Get it while you're hot. There you go. I mean, like, that's what it is. You build on that rhythm. This game hasn't had much of it since the start. But the folks here in Cameron appreciative that the Blue Devils now have their largest lead of the game at 52-40. Duke Brown starting to get things going for Duke because they got a couple jumpers to fall for you adjust as a defense. If I'm an ACC team watching this, that's what I'm doing. I am not letting Vern Vernon Carey beat me. Think yeah, they could use that guy? Yeah, I'd say oh, a lot of teams. You know what? The 76ers could use him back. <laughs> More the steal. Trying to find Carey, who's back in the game underneath. Lob over top, deflected. Carey recovers in the corner. O'Connell turns the corner. White misses the follow slam. Down a dozen. Brown with nine minutes gone here in the second. Has Cho turn it over. That is 15 on the day. Before the shot, we've got a blocking foul. We'll take a break one more time with the Blue Doubles, up 12. Players are your best players. They are your natural born leaders. They've grown into the role that they're in. That's a pretty good baseline out of bounds coming out of a timeout. There's a reason why I shut up. 
It happens every now and then. But I mean that. Look, if your oldest players are not your best players, it's tough. You almost have to have collective leadership. And in a way, that's what you see. They all take ownership of, of what they're responsible for. Duke's done a nice job of taking Hunsaker out of the game. Say what? His first field goal could wind up being four points. Uh, usually on out of bounds underneath, if you give up a basket, let alone a lob dunk, it's because of bad defense. It's usually not. Look, no one should ever score that easily, and this is just a bit of a heave. I love the fact that he shot it. I think Jack White expected to see that shot go up, let alone go in. Well, Zach is a senior from North Salt Lake, Utah. He is now 25 years old, and uh, he uh, went on an LDS mission coming out of high school. And when he was in Mozambique, he actually thought he was going to come back to the States and play for his dad, Dick, who was then the head coach at Utah Valley. But while son was over in Mozambique on his mission, his father decided to retire. So when he came back to the States, he didn't have a Division I offer, went to junior college at Snow College in Utah. And his recruitment really blew up. I mean, Texas Tech wanted this guy. Penn State wanted this guy. He's the highest rated recruit Mike Martin and his staff has gotten in his eight years in charge at Brown. It's a great story, too. I mean, like, when you're an NBA prospect, your age is a problem, right? We say, oh, he's 22 years old. He's just past his prime. I mean, he's not a lottery pick. That's ridiculous. But when you're a college player, that experience, that, that life experience ultimately makes you a leader on the floor. And he is the rare three-time captain who uh, is a married man as well. Zach married his sweetheart Megan over the summer, and she made the trip to here in Durham, a chance to come inside Cameron Indoor. Here is her husband with the basketball. Smokes, what was I waiting for? He didn't waste any time. No. Although he is 25. Anderson, around and out. Carey had that ball go off his fingertips out of bounds. Well, here was uh, the wedding day during the offseason for Zach and Megan Hunsaker. There's his mom and dad as well. Dick on the left, who was a longtime Division I head coach. He took Ball State to the Sweet 16 back in 1990. And he thought he was going to be able to play for his dad out in Utah, but uh, didn't work out that way. And he always wanted to be an Ivy Leaguer. And he's going to have himself an Ivy League degree from Brown University. Out of bounds. Bears give it back to the Blue Devils. Well, I understand the stress. <laughs> you got to be a broadcaster. We never lose. Megan Hunsaker enjoying watching her husband, but uh, you can see the stress on her face down 11. Terry's pass a little too far for White to reach. Here comes Hunsaker. Great job to run the floor, though, and cleaned it up by Josh Howard, who's got seven points. That was a really hard smack of the backboard. Could you hear that from up here? Basket's still shaking, He's by the way. still shaking. I mean, that hurt my hand just thinking about it. Under nine minutes to go. Oh, good sloppy. Do turnover. Perry Cowan dumps it off. White the block shot. And it's Duke possession. I wasn't kidding about this. This was a hard slap. I'm going to stop talking. Listen for it. I mean, it's, it really didn't play at all. It didn't, that sound didn't help me any. I'm trying to talk about how loud it was. <laughs> we heard like a little Q-tip hitting the backboard. I think you made your point. It was loud, I swear. What we need now is a shot of Wendell Moore flexing his hand to prove how hard he hit the rim or hit the backboard. And he's out of the game, carries out, White takes a seat. Stanley, hurt with the basketball. Delorier all back on the floor for Coach K. O'Connell attacks the baseline, his pass off the hand of a teammate. Duke able to save to Hurt. Hurt lined it up but left it short, out of bounds, back to Brown. Well, oh, you think about ACC play getting started next for Duke on New Year's Eve day, correct? So you said New Year's Eve day? Is it New Year's Eve evening, actually. It's a 6 o'clock New Year's Eve, tip. okay, here we go. New Year's Eve. Attention to detail, sense of urgency, all things required in conference play. 
really interested to see how they finish this game. Because at some point, you, you've got to build a little bit of momentum that, that follows you into the next game. There you go. There's hey, proof. He's shaking his hand. I, I see I wasn't messing around. I'm serious. All right, director Dan Regan all over that shot. Trying to have your back there, Thank Mr. You, Crispin. Dan. I, I do. It, it, it was probably from like 20 minutes ago. It was <laughs> Tend to shoot just over eight minutes remaining as Brown hangs in there with Duke. Hunsaker had to force it up. It's not a turnover, but it may as well be. Good defense by the Blue Devils. Well, Duke's defense is good when they're able to get set, see the basketball. They need to continue to improve upon how they defend in a scramble situation where you are chasing the play and communication is most important. Tough shot comes back to Moore. We've got a whistle. We'll step away with 728 remaining in regulation here at Cameron. Oh, oh, run late in the first half for the Hoyas. The Hoyas have won five in a row. The Big East, seven or eight bid league, might be the second best league in college basketball. Georgetown up 11. After us, number nine Memphis has won nine straight. Doug John Precious Achua, team's leading scorer and rebounder, looking to make it 10 right here on ESPN2. That's right, Phil. We're looking forward to it. Precious Achua, DJ Jeffries. They get Lester Quinones yep. back today, so no James Wiseman. That's the way it's going to be. But as they are constituted, as far as I'm concerned, Penny Hardaway has a team that can easily get to the second weekend, if not the final four. I would say second weekend, yes. They're still young. And that youth will be exposed, particularly in the NCAA tournament, but they need to look at their conference season as a way to develop into the team that they're going to become. Similar to like in Zaga in years past, the St. Mary's in years past for the West Coast Conference. You've had opportunities to work on who you're going to become. So we'll get you to the Memphis UNO game at the bottom of the hour when we wrap up here at Cameron Indoor. Duke with the basketball leading 55-46 over a pesky Brown Bears team that comes in with a 5-5 five and five record, playing for the first time since a loss at St. John's 18 days ago in a game that Brown easily yep. could have won. They had a breakaway dunk that would have cut the game to two late against the Johnnies. That just kind of hey, deflated them. And what do you know, O'Connell takes a couple of steps back, and Duke has its first made three of the ball game. Kind of rooting for him to make that. One of 14 now as a team. Is that 1,071 games now, right? Something like that. Three, sure. Well, the way the game is played nowadays, whenever I see that stat, I think, well, of course you're going to make three yeah. every game because you take 30 of them. Now, you go, go back to that point you made about Brown in terms of them being able to play with good teams. Well, the other thing is the first thing Coach K said to us to shoot around was they're old. And that's what everybody wants to do. They, they want to get old, they want to stay old because experienced players know how to counter. And you only win with counters, you don't win with set plays. Not at this level. And who's won national championships lately? Virginia, Villanova, yep. with old, talented yes. players. Long two by Wendell Moore. Talented players, experience, but also identity. I identity is something, we, we use the word culture too much. That's lazy defense. With the jump shooting, they have now matched their largest lead at 14. Yeah, well, they finally got something good. Now, it really, it's it's been O'Connell. He, he got two jumpers to fall. And you find a little bit of confidence. Well, why not get another one? Look, it, it could be contagious, right? Missed shots could be contagious. A lack of rhythm is contagious. But made shots can also be infectious, right? You start to feel it a little bit better. You get, your confidence is higher. It's amazing how sometimes it's as simple as mismake basketball. We just overthink it. Probably as a form of job preservation for, for us as analysts. At the line, Brandon Anderson shooting one and one. He's got 15 points to lead Brown. Again, he is the Ivy League's top scorer at 21 per game. Among the most in the country. You know, he's a guy who struggled a lot last year. He had yeah. big numbers as a sophomore and then uh, he and Coach Martin didn't see things eye to eye last year, and both are better for it. Certainly the team is better for it. It's one out of two from the line there. But uh, Anderson's reintegration, if you will, into the team occurred during the August trip to Spain, which really helped to spark yeah. his renaissance. I love that teams get to do that. I really do. Not only is it a great experience, 
But it's great for building that team chemistry. It, it, it is, especially when you've got so many new pieces year in, year out. That's just the way college basketball is with transfer rules being what they are. This is the largest lead off of the hurt basket. Vernon Carey, great defense. No need to reach. That's great defense. Cannot say enough about how good of a job that was by Vernon Carey Jr. To defend, hands wide, slide your feet, contest, force a tough shot. That's all you can do. You don't want to stop or block every single shot. You want to force the toughest shot possible. That's what good defense is. It's as much play in the game of probability as it is a play in the game of stopping your opponent. Mitchell and Cho both now have four personal fouls. And so now Goldwire at the line shooting a one and one. Check that O'Connell shooting a one and one. Tonight, 11.45 Eastern Time. It is Sports Center with SVP reaction from the Fiesta Bowl. And take our first look at the upcoming championship game. And also, we'll hit the hardwood, the NBA best in action, coming up 11.45 p.m. Eastern Time on ESPN and streaming live on the ESPN app. Anderson draws the foul on Carey. And that's where the perimeter defense needs to stay down and win that battle. You cannot continue to give up a dribble drive because you end up putting Vernon Carey in a bad situation on the regular. It's just been simple breakdown after simple breakdown. I know Coach Carey, they're going to sit down and watch this tape and they're going to say, guys, this is just, there's no sense of urgency. There's no discipline in terms of a stance and sliding your feet. All correctable issues. Anderson misses the first. That allows Jalen Ganey to come in and replace Tamanig Cho. Anderson's quite a weapon for Brown. He joined the 1,000 point club back in November when he dropped 32 on Canisius. As much as I'm crushing the defense, he's a tough guy to cover. And when you're constantly looking to attack and you have that much space, you're really hard to cover. Carey tries to lob it into Hurt. Big size advantage. That's an easy two for the six foot nine inch freshman from Rochester, Minnesota. Second time in this game he's been able to do that. It's, it's the presence of mind to recognize that mismatch and going after it. Anderson misses. Moore clears the rebound, and Duke will be in no hurry with just over four minutes remaining. O'Connell pulls the trigger. Give him three more. Well, he's the one guy on this Duke roster, John, that when he gets going, look out. Well, he gets going, you got to continue to feed him because when he doesn't have it going, he, he's not as much of an at, at Cameron Indoor, and it's spectacular. You know, yes, North Carolina Duke would be a, a better matchup to call. Well, you know, reality has me on this broadcast, and it's still awesome. Like, this place doesn't disappoint. Not to mention campus. You know, you forget that these... Yeah, these great arenas, these great environments, they also have fantastic campuses. I got to get out for a walk yesterday. Man, it was terrific. So I'm talking to Brown head coach Mike Martin yesterday after their practice. He likened this to the Palestra. It's another yeah. living museum of yep. the sport of basketball. And I wish there were more of them. Uh, at Penn State, we had Rec Hall, but it became the Bryce whoa, Jones whoa, whoa, Center. Whoa, 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 whoa. You didn't just put... Rec Hall at Penn State anywhere near the same conversation with Cameron and the Palestra. No, 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 but, but they're the same building. They're the same type of buildings. Okay. The Palestra, Cameron Indoor, the uh, Fog Allen Field. Hey, look, it's all that same era of building. But. And, and teams are getting away from that. And that's my point. Before you jump down my throat. <laughs> but wait a second. No, here's the deal. Teams are getting away from it because it's become an entertainment thing. 
What's more entertaining than a game at Cameron Indoor Stadium? Of course, you don't have to convince me of that. We don't need to build a massive arena just to, to, to do monster truck rallies and dirt bike races and Billy Joel concerts. Have a great arena and a great environment for basketball like this. Now, granted, Dean Smith Center, yeah, they're going to pack that out. Rupp Arena, they're going to pack that out. But there are a lot of programs out there that have these massive arenas and they have curtains up. Because they can't fill the seats. That drives me crazy. Well, now you're talking about Penn State. I mean, there's a perfect example that that building is too large for that program. Yeah, and they know. just don't fill it. They fill it for wrestling. They fill it for other sports. Yep. But not for men's basketball. Hockey. Britney Spears got it filled up. I'm sure she did. I'll tell you what they've done here at Duke is poured a lot of great money over the years into making sure this is a modern building, yeah. much like they did it in Chicago with Wrigley Field. Yes. Keeping the feel of what it was like 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago, but you don't feel uncomfortable with when you're here. You're comfortable no. with the creature comforts yeah. we're used to. Creature comforts? I mean, how about just... Too easy. Wendell Moore now with eight points after the slam dunk that makes it 73-48. How about a great environment and a home court advantage for basketball? That, to me, has more value than a big old empty arena. Cho, tough runner off the glass. He's been held to five points. That's nine under his season average. Nonetheless, Brown was able to hang around until the later stages. They were down only six at the break, but Duke has started to get it rolling here in the second. They have. I mean, part of it is you got defense spaced out. Finally made a couple three-point shots. Very Carey Jr. Great job with keeping his eyes up. Not enough to be a displacement foul there. Just defense fell apart. Duke finally, you know, kind of turning it up a notch to put this thing away. But that sense of urgency, that, that's got to be there from the start. I, I have to think it might be there if Trey Jones starts this game. Again, not only offensive initiator, but that a game initiator. No double-double today for Vernon Carey, 19.6 rebounds. He's been replaced by one of the co-captains, Justin Robinson. Mike Buckmeyer has also come in. Here's Robinson, gonna have to put it up. We saw in the pregame warmups, John, Justin Robinson doing a 360 slam dunk, and this young man who doesn't get many minutes. It's just remarkable the talent that Duke has. There's another block shot from big number 50, the Admiral's son. It leads to a layup at the other end by Moore. I, I think we should make note that it wasn't just a normal there there's there's the dad the admiral david robinson it wasn't just a normal 360 duck i don't even know what he did but it was ridiculous you just forget the level i mean when you go from high school to college college to pros all these kids want to be pros but they have no idea what it's really all about yet yeah you don't realize that the the level of the jump it's significant his dad, of course, was the National Player of the Year at Navy. There's another block shot that makes Dad proud. I remember that Sports Illustrated article. Came out, the Admirals on the cover. More, Buckmeyer. Couldn't get the roll. With the shot clock off. I love Duke fans. They, they, they want to see more dunks, more threes, more dominance. Davis Franks in the game for Brown. And if you're a Brown Bear, if you can score here, you can forever say I put one in yep. at Cameron Indoor. That'll do it. Duke runs its win streak to five and is now.